Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this World Anti-Doping Agency webinar on the agency's enhanced compliance monitoring program, a timely topic coinciding with the first full compliance review of the 2015 World Anti-Doping Code. After something of a hiatus, I'm delighted to say we're back with our webinar series, which are designed to help our stakeholders with the implementation of the 2015 code. And today's session is especially for national anti-doping organizations and international federations. And I'm delighted to say that we have a full house here today with over 200 uh, registrants. So thank you for tuning in. We'll do our best to address your questions in the second half of today's session after the presentation. First of all, a few introductions. My name is Ben Nichols. I'm the Senior Media Relations and Communications Manager for WADA and the moderator for this session today. It's a pleasure to introduce a trio of presenters for you. We have Tim Ricketts, the Director of Standards and Harmonization here at WADA. And joining Tim, we have Kevin Haynes, Senior Manager for Standards and Harmonization, and Emiliano Simonelli, the Senior Manager for Code Compliance. And joining Tim, Emiliano, and Kevin, I'm also delighted to say we have someone very familiar to you all, Fred Donze, the Chief Operating Officer of WADA, and of course the former Director of International Federations uh, based in Lausanne. So in terms of today's session, we will have the presentation that Tim, Kevin, and Emiliano will take us through. And following that, we will have an extensive question and answer session. So we will invite you to send your questions in. You will find a questions tab on your control panels. So please write those in throughout the presentation. And indeed, once the presentation is finished, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. So without further ado, I will hand over to Tim to kickstart today's presentation on compliance monitoring. Thank you, Tim. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the topics that we will cover for today's presentation are as follows. I'll provide a high-level overview of the new compliance uh, monitoring program. I'll then hand over to Emiliano, who will provide background on the policy and process that supports the compliance program. Uh, Kevin Haynes will then walk you through the major areas of the compliance questionnaire and provide a preview of some of the functionalities of the new online system that you will be required to complete. We'll then wrap up the presentation with next steps and what you as signatories can do to prepare for it. And then as Ben mentioned, we'll open up for some Q&A at the end of the presentation. The need to measure the quality of anti-doping programs and identify opportunities to improve has never been greater for the protection of clean sport. Athletes expect and deserve credible anti-doping programs. Following recent events, athletes' trust in the anti-doping system has been challenged. Clean athletes and the sporting world have called for greater accountability of those responsible for protecting them and their sport and the implementation of WADA's new compliance process therefore comes at an opportune time. For the past two years, WADA's focus has been in assisting signatories with their implementation of the 2015 code and the various international standards. And of course, this will continue. Our focus, however, now turns to measuring the mandatory programs that all signatories signed up to in the 2015 code and standards. For this compliance program to be a success, it will require a close collaborative partnership between your organization and WADA. And WADA sees this monitoring program as a partnership to compliance. All international federations and national anti-doping organizations that are signatories to the 2015 code will be subject to the compliance process. And this equates to over 320 signatories. The program will start with an online self-assessment questionnaire which will be distributed next month to all international federations and NATOs. Once the signatory completes the questionnaire and submits it to WADA, it will be closely reviewed. If shortfalls in programs are identified, then corrective actions will be tabled in a report and provided back to the signatory for them to address within a defined time period. The corrective actions will, where applicable, be provided with a reference to supporting material, such as a guideline document, to assist you in meeting the required action. 
Following the review of the questionnaire and based on other supporting data such as Adams or other information or intelligence that WADA has access to, a number of signatories will be identified for an in-person audit. The audit will further validate answers provided to the questionnaire and will also look at how your organisation implements your various programs in more detail, which of course is difficult to do solely using a self-assessment process. Throughout the completion of the compliance program, from the questionnaire to the implementation of any corrective actions or the audit process, there will be regular dialogue and support provided by WADA, and in particular from WADA's regional offices. This is where the collaboration aspect is so important. So we encourage you to reach out if you need any assistance in any part of the monitoring program at any time. To ensure the review of each signatory's program is dealt with in a consistent way, the compliance program has been certified under the ISO 9001-2015 program. The objective is therefore to enhance as many programs as possible and to ensure quality is at the forefront while ensuring that signatories are held accountable to their commitment to implementing the code effectively. As this is a partnership to compliance, I must stress that WADA is not setting out to declare signatories non-compliant. However, there are of course systems that must be built in to address a non-willingness to participate in this process, which we hope we do not have to use. I'll now hand over to Emiliano. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and good day, everyone. Uh, the first uh, slide is about the uh, uh, compliance process that, as uh, most of you already know, is a three-step process. The first step is a code acceptance. All of your organizations have already completed the code acceptance step, meaning that they have signed the code acceptance form. The second step is the implementation of the code in the internal legal system. Here, uh, the situation can really be different depending on whether we are talking about international federations or national development organizations. In particular, bear in mind that some uh, national development organizations need legislative amendments in order to implement the code in the internal legal system. The third step, once the code has been implemented in the legal system, is the development of a code compliant anti doping program. In the key areas of testing, investigations, therapeutic use exceptions, um, education, results management. In order to face the challenges represented by this new uh, program, what are has um, created an internal compliance task force. This is a unit that is composed by representatives of different departments within WADA and that meets every second week to discuss big picture uh, uh, compliance situations as well as specific cases that are code compliance related. Within the uh, internal compliance task force, we have created a compliance unit. Compliance unit that is in charge of communication with signatories, but also communication with the compliance review committee. The compliance review committee is a body in charge of recommending to the foundation board possible non-compliance. In order to provide you more details about these two bodies, I will start with the internal compliance task force. As mentioned, it's being created to coordinate WADA's compliance activities. This means that from now on, WADA will be speaking with one voice for all compliance related matters. So uh, you will not have to see anymore a situation where you receive compliance related messages from different departments within WADA. From now on, it all will be centralized and has already been centralized, in fact, through the compliance task force. Um, when there is a compliance issue that cannot be solved easily by the department involved, the issue is brought forward to the attention of the Compliance Task Force. The Compliance Task Force discusses this issue and might decide 
to uh, initiate the uh, compliance uh, process that, uh, as mentioned by team, is ISO accredited. It also, the Compliance Task Force also coordinates communication with the Compliance Review Committee, that is the counterpart as independent body in charge of all compliance matters. Uh, the F Compliance Review Committee uh, created um, uh, more than a year ago uh, at its first meeting in February 2015 and uh, has been recently upgraded to a standing committee of WADA. It provides independent and expert advice to both WADA staff and the WADA Foundation Board on all compliance related matters. This means that the Compliance Review Committee has the possibility to provide guidance and advice on the further development of the compliance program, but also on specific cases. And it is the body in charge of making recommendations on uh, possible non-compliance to other foundation board. Uh, the Compliance Review Committee meets in person at least four uh, times a year and then we can have teleconferences uh, with the Compliance Review Committee as much as needed. It is composed by experts from different uh, areas, all related to compliance, such as, for example, aviation and pharmaceuticals. This slide is meant to provide with you an overview of the compliance process that has been recently ISO accredited. The idea behind this process is that WADA always wants to maintain a dialogue with the signatory concerned and ensure that the signatory is given uh, plenty of time and opportunities to take the required corrective actions before a possible declaration of non-compliance. Uh, when there is a, a compliance ready issue, first of all, the department or departments involved within WADA try to solve it in the best of their possibilities with the uh, signatory concern. If this is not possible within a reasonable timeline, then the issue is brought forward by the department or the department's concern to the task force. The task force discusses the issue and has the possibility to um, provide the signatory with a three-month deadline to solve that issue. This three-month deadline can be extended only once under exceptional circumstances. If the three-month deadline expires without the signatory having taken the required action despite what assistance and guidance provided in the meantime, uh, the case is transferred by the Compliance Task Force to the Compliance Review Committee. At that point, there are three possibilities. The first possibility is that the Compliance Review Committee considers that the case uh, does not imply any non-compliance, and in that case, the procedure ends there. The second possibility is that the Compliance Review Committee considers that the case shows a non-compliance, and recommends the Foundation Board to declare the signatory concern non-compliant with immediate effect. The third possibility is that the, foundation, the Compliance Review Committee considers that the case is, shows a non-compliance, but the signatory has provided with a detailed timeline to solve the outstanding issue within four months from the date of the next Foundation Board meeting. In that case, the Compliance Review Committee may recommend to the Foundation Board to declare the signatory concern non-compliant without immediate effect. The declaration of non-compliance will only become effective after the expiration of the four months period if the corrective action hasn't been taken by then. In other words, this third possibility gives the signatory an additional opportunity, an additional time to solve the issue, and it can be activated by the Compliance Review Committee as long as WADA has received a detailed calendar and a clear commitment from the signatory to solve that specific issue. Once a non-compliance is, uh, non is declared by the Foundation Board, of course, um, the signatory concern has the possibility under the World Anti-Doping Code to appeal the decision uh, to CAS, to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Uh, once the decision on non-compliance is, is made by the Foundation Board, there are consequences that are um, 
proposed by WADA and are meant to be implemented by other organizations. And we'll talk in details about them in a minute. In the meantime, uh, WADA clearly indicates to the signatory or reiterates what is the corrective action needed in order to uh, be reinstated, in order for the organization to be taken out of the non-compliance list. At the same time, WADA provides guidance and assistance to the signatory concerned to make sure that that corrective action can be taken as quickly as possible. Once the corrective action is taken, then the signatory can be reinstated in other words, can be taken out of the non-compliance list. As for the process that leading to the restatement, it is the same leading to the declaration of non-compliance. In other words, uh, the task force has to review the facts, inform the compliance review committee that can make a recommendation to the foundation board to restate a specific signatory. As I mentioned, uh, I think it is worthwhile to uh, spend a couple of minutes consequences in case of non-compliance uh, under the current legal framework. Uh, the World Anti-Doping Code contains uh, certain consequences to be implemented mainly by international federations and major event organizations. As far as international federations are concerned, uh, the main requirement is to do everything possible not to award world championships to uh, countries whose national doping organization has been declared non-compliant. As far as major event organizations are concerned, the main requirement is to uh, do everything possible not to award events to a country whose national doping organization is in non-compliance. Uh, we also have consequences under WADA statutes in relation to participation to WADA standing committees and representation in uh, WADA foundation board and executive committee and consequences under a policy recently adopted by the foundation board. Under this policy, representatives from a non-compliant anti-doping organizations are not allowed to participate to WADA outreach program or independent observer missions. We also have consequences under the international standard for laboratories, in particular as far as the maintenance of an accreditation of what accredited laboratory is concerned. In other words, if the local national anti organization is declared non-compliant, under Article 4.4 of the international standard for laboratories, uh, under certain conditions, the laboratory might um, lose the accreditation or to be more precise, the accreditation might be suspended and until the non-compliance situation is solved by the, the NADO concern. Uh, there are also consequences set by the International Olympic Committee in the um, uh, IOC chart, by the International Paralympic Committee in the IPC handbook, and by UNESCO in, uh, in the convention. Of course, it is up to these, these organizations uh, to implement the consequences of, uh, of non-compliance, if need be. And uh, this leads to uh, the end of uh, the presentation uh, on consequences of non-compliance, and I'll leave the floor to Kevin Haynes. Thank you. Thank you, Emiliano, and hello, everybody. Uh, the purpose of this part of the webinar is to provide more detail on the questionnaire itself and also look at some of the features of the online system that we'll be sending to signatories soon. As mentioned earlier, the questionnaire is one of the tools WADA will use to monitor and assess a signatory's compliance with the code. The questionnaire provides a platform for signatories to provide data to WADA so that they can comply with the code article 23.5.2. The questionnaires contained are designed not only to measure the mandatory provisions of the code and international standards, but as Tim said, also measure the quality of the implementation of a signatory's anti-doping program. The questionnaire has been a year-long project, and we are very grateful to the invaluable input of 20 anti-doping organizations who were part of a pilot group. These organizations have provided ongoing feedback on the questions themselves and also the usability of the online system. So thank you again to those organizations. To assist signatures prepare for the release of the questionnaire, we did issue the latest version of the questionnaire at the time in July 2016. The intention was for signatures to identify any shortcomings in their program and implement appropriate strategies 
to enhance their programs in advance of the release of the questionnaire. As we look into the questionnaire in more detail, an important element of the process is the identification of a compliance contact for each signatory. In December 2016, we communicated with all signatories to establish the individual who will act as the contact as they will become our main point of contact for the questionnaire. The process for completing the questionnaire will start in the second half of February when we invite the compliance contact to register on the system on behalf of their organization. From the date of the initial notification to register, signatories will have three months to complete and submit their questionnaire in full. To assist signatories, the online system is available in both French and English, as is um, the user guide which will accompany the, the system. It is important to say at the outset, the questionnaire is thorough and in total there are over 300 questions. However, it is also important to point out that the questionnaire is also dynamic in nature. By that we mean that you only answer questions specific to your program. So for example, if you do not have an athlete biological passport program, then you won't have to complete the questions on that topic, you would skip to the next section. Another important point to mention is that we are assessing your 2016 activity. So that is the period from January to December 2016. Throughout the questionnaire this period may also be referred to as the reporting period, however they are considered the same. So looking at the questionnaire itself, it is split into seven sections. In order to provide some more insight into the content, I will quickly run through these sections. The first section is titled Adam's Budget and Reporting and is largely self-explanatory in terms of looking at organizations' budget breakdown of their various anti-doping programs, their use of Adam's and annual reporting of statistics. Section 2 is testing and investigations and is the largest section of the questionnaire. This section is split into eight subsections to assist the user to navigate through them in a logical manner. Another good example of the dynamic nature of the questionnaire, if you don't have your own sample collection personnel program, then you would skip through this section entirely. The final subsection being self-assessment of your intelligence methods and capabilities. The results management section is section 3 and this covers the full results management process and procedure and is split into 16 subsections. Section 4 refers to therapeutic use exemptions. We are seeking responses here around the application process, TUE committee establishment and membership, the review process and ultimate decisions that are made by signatories when assessing TUEs. Section 5 is education. Here we are looking at who is educated by a signatory, whether it's athletes and athlete support personnel and other people, and how they are organised to deliver that education. Section 6 is linked to data privacy. This section focuses on how athletes consent within each signatory statutes and policies and how personal data is stored and shared by your organization. The final section, section seven, is called other ADO information. Here the questions don't necessarily count towards the compliance assessment, but they are important background questions required to understand the environment in how an organization operates. So here we're looking at strategic and operational plans, staffing roles and responsibilities, and legislation. Because of the large range of questions, we thought it would be good to share with you the different type of responses a signatory can make in the questionnaire. The questionnaire is designed to focus on allowing signatories to provide their responses in the most efficient manner possible. Some questions are specific to NARDOs and some to IFs. So if you see a jump in the question numbers, please don't be alarmed. The majority of the questions are simple yes, no responses, sometimes coupled with the requirement to provide context to why you answered no to a certain question. This can either be in the form of a free text box with the emphasis on a very brief response, 
or a seri series of single or multiple choice options. For some key questions, we ask you to upload your existing documentation. For example, your test distribution plan for 2016. For TDP and risk assessment, we've also provided a template document should you require it. But you are encouraged to use your own if you've already uh, done these documents. We also provide guidance in the user guide of acceptable document types that can be uploaded and the size of these documents. Another common type of question are those requiring a numerical response. Numerical data, for example, is requested when responding about the composition of your registered testing pool and the number of tests allocated to these athletes. So moving forward to the second part of February and the release of the questionnaire, the compliance contact will receive the initial registration notification to the email address that you have provided to WADA. The email will be sent by the compliance at WADA email address. The compliance contact will then be able to register themselves. The compliance contact has administration rights within the system for their organization, so has to be the first person to register. Also contained in this initial communication will be access to the user guide, which we strongly encourage you to read prior to accessing the system. The final important piece of information in this communication is your deadline to submit a completed questionnaire. To ensure signatures don't lose any time, we will send regular reminders both to register on the system and also to submit your completed questionnaire as the deadline nears. So once the user is registered, they will see the login page that you can see on your screen now. The username and the password is the one created by yourself during the registration process. The system also has a forgot password function if required. And finally, in terms of where the system can be used and how, the system is compatible with a computer, obviously, a tablet, and smartphone, and is accessible anywhere with internet connectivity. One important point to mention, and topical at the moment, is security. The system is equipped with the latest security features designed to protect your data. So once you've su successfully logged in, you will be directed to the home page. From here, you can switch the language between English and French. Again, you have access to the user guide, and you will also see the latest progress status of your organization. Obviously, this will be zero the first time the compliance contact enters the system. From the home page, you can enter the questionnaire by simply clicking on Open Questionnaire. As mentioned at the outset, there are a number of design features to assist you in completing the questionnaire as efficiently as possible. All the features are described in greater detail in the user guide but I'll quickly run through a number of the key features for you now. The compliance contact is able to create as many users across their organization as required. This will allow large multi-departmental organizations to allocate work across the organization and hopefully reduce the time taken to complete. To stop multiple users overriding each other's work, a lock function has been built to prevent this. As you can see now on the screen in the top left-hand corner, uh, the individual as the section locked is clearly visible in green text. If another colleague is editing a section, you will see their name in red text and you will not be able to edit that section. Where relevant, references to code and international standard articles can be accessed and they will appear in a pop-up box format. This will assist users understand the requirements. As you can see on the screen now, an example, if you see the reference to the ISTI article 4.1.3, when clicked, the article appears in full, which hopefully help you understand the requirements of that question. Similarly, there are links to relevant guidance documents, definitions of keywords in some questions, and templates that can be used by organizations to provide their information if they don't already have these. In this example, you can see the risk assessment template highlighted in the red box. Clicking on this hyperlink uploads a template which can be downloaded and used if required. The final features are designed to allow organizations monitor their progress towards achieving a 100% completed questionnaire. Firstly, there is an incomplete answers button designed to quickly identify unanswered questions 
this feature is particularly helpful when a section is close to being complete. As you can see, the incomplete answers button is in the top right corner of the system. When selected, any unanswered questions appear in a very nice pink. The final feature to share with you is in section 8, which monitors the progress of the signatories towards their completed questionnaire. In this section, there is a visual representation of both the overall progress and progress within each section. It is important to note that only when the questionnaire has been completed 100% can it be submitted, and equally important, only the compliance contact has the submit button. This represents another important role the compliance contact plays as they are encouraged to complete a full review of all sections prior to clicking submit. Once a questionnaire has been submitted, the signatory cannot make any more changes. The questionnaire is always available to the signatory, but in a read-only, non-editable format. So to conclude this part of the webinar, upon receiving the questionnaire, WADA will conduct a review and use data held in Adams the Results Management Database and other sources to assess the compliance of a signatory's program. Once that review is completed, a corrective action report will be generated if required. The corrective action report will include guidance on what needs correcting, together with supporting documentation on how to correct it. Also, each corrective action will have a deadline to implement depending on the importance or priority of the program area. This will either be three, six, or nine months. In addition, the signature will be required to provide WADA with a corrective action plan, clearly outlining how they intend to implement the corrective actions. So that completes the overview of the questionnaire. Thank you for your attention. I will now hand back to Tim, who will wrap up with the next steps. Thanks, Kevin. Just to touch now on uh, prefer preparing for the compliance monitoring program, uh, the first point of call is to really ensure that you've confirmed your compliance contact with WADA. You can contact us through uh, specific email compliance at wada-ama.org to ensure that the questionnaire can be received by your organisation. Uh, if you have not already reviewed the draft questionnaire that was distributed back to all signatories in July, we suggest you do so. Please note, however, there are some uh, slight changes to that version, um, but the majority of it remains uh, the same. Signatories should be looking at documenting their policies and procedures, as Kevin mentioned, the risk assessment, and also the provision of the 2016 TDP will be required. Please ensure that all doping control forms and TUEs from 2016 have been entered <coughs> into Adams. At this point, we've achieved 86% uh, entry of the doping control forms. So we thank everyone for uh, addressing that. If you outsource part of your program to a private sample collection agency, your organisation is the signatory remains responsible for those parts of the program you outsource. So it's going to require you to ensure that uh, through some checks and balances, those organisations are delivering your programs in accordance with the standard. There are a number of WADA guidelines and tools that are available on WADA's website to further assist you as well. In terms of next step, the questionnaire is to be issued uh, mid to late February. And as Kevin mentioned, again, the three months to complete. So that will be mid to late May when that will be due back. Start addressing any shortfalls that uh, you may pick up when you're working through the uh, self-assessment questionnaire. Don't wait for WADA to send you a corrective action report. We will also be hosting a workshop at the upcoming WADA annual symposium in Lausanne. Uh, we'll also have a compliance booth set up, so for any of you that have questions and don't wish to ask them in a workshop environment, you can come up and, and meet the compliance team and we'll sit down and work through you whether that's a question to how to answer the self-assessment questionnaire or any other question you may have. 
And WADA will uh, obviously then review the completed questionnaires and, and conduct audits on a priority basis. So just to summarise, the Enhanced Compliance Monitoring Program will be the most re robust evaluation of global anti-doping activity that WADA has ever undertaken. The main objective is to support signatories in enhancing their programs and to further protect the clean athletes. And as I mentioned before, we're not here to purely declare signatories non-compliant. You'll see the email address there that you can uh, contact WADA on with any questions or if you require any support. And overall, we look forward to your continued collaboration and partnership on this compliance monitoring process. That concludes the uh, webinar presentation aspect. We'll now hand back to Ben Nichols, our moderator, who will open up the questions and answers to you. Well, thanks, Tim, Kevin, and Emiliano for the very thorough run through of the monitoring program. I'm pleased to say we've had a flurry of questions in the last 20 minutes or so that have come in, and we will begin with quite a simple question. Tim, I'll go straight back to you with this one. Does the compliance process apply to major event organizers as well? Thanks, Ben. Well, as I mentioned, the self-assessment questionnaire is, is being developed for international federations and NADOs. MEOs are, of course, still signatories to the code and are still will be monitored, uh, but they won't be part of completing the self-assessment questionnaire. Um, obviously, MEOs will need to make sure their rules for their major events are in line with the code, and WADA's uh, independent observer program will also continue in observing uh, major event organisations and then publicly reporting on those. But at this point, the MEOs will not be required to complete the self-assessment questionnaire. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Tim. And uh, just a reminder for those that didn't hear it at the beginning, if you have any questions, you can type them in into your questions tab on the control panel, and we will try and get through as many as we can in the last 20 minutes or so. Um, our next question, Kevin, I'll put this to you. It's regarding in-person audits. Is an in-person audit an indication of the level of an organization's compliance, and are there criteria to determine who gets that type of audit? Kevin. Thanks, Ben. Uh, yes, we have been developing some criteria uh, which will form the basis of selecting signatories for in-person audits. Uh, the level of compliance is, is one aspect which we will take from the self-assessment questionnaire, but we'll also be looking at other sources of information including atoms and any intelligence that we, we may have uh, when deciding on who to select. Just a, a follow-up, Kevin, on audits. Who will conduct those in-person audits and, and what will be their level of qualifications and training and so forth? Thanks, Ben. Uh, we will have a team of people from WADA and we will also identify and train some external uh, people to fulfill the role of auditor. Everybody will be trained to uh, regulation standards to make sure that when we do come to the audits, they're done in a, a fair impartial and objective way. Thank you. Our next question I'll put to Fred Donze. The, is there a process in place to remedy a, a situation between WADA and the signatory in question, um, or do they have to wait until they get to the, the Court of Arbitration for Sport Appeal process uh, if they have any concerns with a decision made by the task force? Thanks, Ben, and uh, good morning, yeah, everybody, everybody from uh, from Montreal. Uh, yes, there, there is a process in place, and for those of you uh, on the call who are uh, more familiar with compliance, uh, you will know that WADA, two years ago already, uh, created what we call a compliance review committee. This committee is basically an independent, non-political committee, which is responsible for providing guidance and advice, not only to WADA's management, but also uh, to WADA's foundation board, and executive committee for any uh, code compliance matters, including potentially recommending uh, situations and uh, decisions of uh, non 
ground compliance to Waters Foundation Board, which is the key governing body in this uh, in this matter. Uh, this compliance review committee is composed of uh, representatives uh, of the athletes, of sports, of governments, and most importantly, uh, experts from compliance. Uh, coming from industries outside uh, anti-doping and sports, uh, from aeronautical industry, pharmaceutical industry, and uh, and so on. So really, the compliance review committee is the intermediate level between what Waters Management does and the decisions made in terms of compliance by Waters Foundation Board, and they provide a, a very strong element of uh, independence and expertise uh, between these uh, the, these two layers. Thank you, uh, Fred. Our next question, I'll go back to Tim with this one. Regarding prioritizing the review of the questionnaires, there's also going to be uh, a huge number coming in. How will WADA prioritize that process? Thanks, Ben. We will have a review team in place uh, that will be ready to receive and assess the questionnaires. We'll be looking at um, prioritizing those reviews, and uh, these will be raised as they come in through the internal compliance task force, obviously we can't look at all 300 questionnaires at once, so we have to have a priority basis in doing that and that will be dealt through the internal task force here at WADA. Thanks Tim. Our next question, uh, back to Fred with this one, regarding the audits. Uh, how many audits do we envisage uh, WADA will conduct this year? And a second question, how will an organisation be no know if they have been selected for one of those audits? I was referring earlier in the uh, conversation to the uh, Water Compliance Review Committee, and uh, the Compliance Review Committee uh, required from Water's management to conduct a minimum of 10 audits in 2017. Uh, as Kevin mentioned earlier in the conversation, uh, these audits uh, will be based on a number of predetermined elements. Uh, the Compliance Review Committee will approve them before they are conducted and uh, the signatory, the relevant signatory, uh, will be notified well in advance in writing uh, if they have been identified for, for an audit. We want this process to be as uh, transparent as possible, uh, so there will be a list of uh, upcoming audits published on WADA's website and the Compliance Review Committee requested also uh, for the reports of the audits in one way or the other to be, to be published. We want this uh, process to be as transparent as possible and, uh, and, and we are committed to doing it. Thanks Fred. Uh, our next question uh, for, for Kevin. What does an organization do if they don't know the answer to a particular question or do not have that data available in order to answer that question? Thanks, Ben. Um, the main reason we've given signatories the three-month deadline is to be able to uh, review all their 2016 data, talk to their service providers if required, and collate that well in advance of meeting the deadline. So hopefully the three months uh, provide sufficient time for a signatory to collate, uh, digest and review their own data before submitting it into the questionnaire. Thanks Kevin. Our next question is regarding service providers. You, uh, Tim, you touched on this in the presentation, but if we can just uh, provide a bit more clarification in terms of what happens if an organization outsources their program to a service provider. Uh, are they able to enter data on their behalf? Yeah, I think uh, as the signatory uh, has a contractual relationship with the third party that they should be able to retrieve any relevant information directly from their service providers in answering their questions. Um, ultimately, as I mentioned, the signatory is responsible for the information that they submit to WADA uh, through the questionnaire. and. Uh, and through the agreements that the signatories have with third party providers, obviously they need to um, undertake some uh, checking to make sure that certain parts of that program that they'll be delivering for them will be in line with the code. So uh, private sample collection organisations are not signatories to the code, but obviously they have a requirement to deliver the programs of signatories in line with the code. 
Thank you, Tim. Uh, our next question, I'll go to Emiliano for this one, regarding the questionnaire and is it available in any language other than English or French? Thank you, Ben. Uh, the questionnaire is available only in English and French, which are the two official languages of, of WADA. Um, the corrective action, if required, uh, will be communicated in the same language the questionnaire was submitted in. Um, there are, of course, as mentioned by Kevin during the presentation, some uh, free text boxes in the questionnaire and in some cases uh, some attachments, some documents have to be provided by the, the signatories. Uh, we do encourage uh, all signatories to provide those documents, if possible, in English and French. Uh, if not, uh, the, I mean, if the attaching documents are provided in a, a, another language, such as, for example, Spanish, it might take a bit longer for what to assess, and we might have to ask the signatory for the clarifications of this. Thank you, Emiliano. Our next question, uh, we'll go to Fred with this one. Uh, following, of course, the, the recent hacking attempts, uh, how confident are we that the online questionnaires safe and secure and what guarantees can we provide ADOs that their data will indeed be safe? Thank you. This is a, a very valid question, of course. Uh, as, you, as you know, WADA uh, takes IT security and, uh, and personal data protection extremely seriously. And in this regard, uh, we believe that uh, we, we have done and we will continue to do our utmost uh, to protect uh, the, the, the security and the safety of the questionnaire as best as possible. Uh, to give you uh, a few examples of what we have done over the past few months uh, to guarantee this security, uh, all the data is encrypted uh, following the, the most secure protocols. Uh, the credentials are stored using the latest and the most uh, secured uh, algorithm. Uh, we have also worked uh, with an external security provider uh, to scan the system for any type of vulnerabilities and uh, I must say that the outcomes uh, were, were, were very positive, basically no, no vulnerabilities uh, have been detected. Uh, we will work also uh, with uh, a system of recapture to ensure that uh, uh, we prevent robot scans and, uh, and attacks. Uh, this is a, a system that you find in, uh, in many different types of, uh, of entry into uh, an online questionnaire to ensure that uh, the uh, authors of the answers are not uh, robots. Uh, in, 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 in summary, we, we, we have done quite a number of things and we have taken quite a number of measures to ensure uh, the safety of the questionnaire and we will continue to do so. The system will be monitored uh, 24 hours a day uh, to prevent and to alert any intrusions and, uh, and I can assure you that this is, will be absolutely, uh, this will be a, a key element of our work in terms of compliance as it is in every element of what we do at work. Well, thanks, Fred. Uh, our next question is regarding the uh, uh, submitting of questionnaires. It, it, Kevin, I'll put this one to you. What happens if an anti-doping organization um, does not submit their questionnaire by the deadline given? Thanks, Ben. Well, as I mentioned before, the three-month period hopefully uh, provides signatories with sufficient time to complete the questionnaire. Uh, to make sure you don't miss any of the dates, we're going to send reminders both to register and to uh, submit the questionnaire as the deadline nears. However, if a signatory does not submit the questionnaire before the deadline, then the matter will be discussed at the uh, next internal compliance task force meeting after that deadline. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, one more question to come in a second for you, just a reminder to all attendees to please type in your questions. We have about 10 minutes or so remaining, so we do have time for a few more questions, so get those into us uh, as soon as you can. Um, Kevin, I'll put this next one to you. It's a follow-up question regarding the in-person audits. Can you tell us a little bit more about how they will work in practice and, of course, who would incur any costs? A lot of the in-person audit uh, logistics is still being discussed, um, but it's anticipated that uh, WADA will cover the costs for the flights and accommodation of the auditors. Uh, we anticipate usually that the audit will take two to three days, however this could be longer depending on the size of the organisation. But we will work together with the 
signatory involved uh, when planning the, the audit. And I do believe we're also going to put on a uh, audit uh, frequently asked questions document on our compliance section of the website as well to, to help people prepare should they be notified for an in-person audit. Thank you, Kevin. Our next question I'll put to Tim. What kind of help can be expected from WADA to take corrective actions that might be necessary and identified through the questionnaire or through the audits? of the questionnaire or uh, the completion of an audit, what will be developed will be a, a corrective action report and this will outline clearly uh, the area of the shortfall that's been identified and also what action is required to address that. Um, we'll also provide some guidance where we have information available in a guideline or in the relevant standard where the uh, signatory can go to uh, get that assistance and understand the principle of what they need to be implementing. In addition, there will also be a human touch to that as well, and uh, both staff in WADA and also in WADA's regional offices will be on hand to uh, assist with the uh, implementation of those corrective action reports. So once these reports are received, a corrective action plan will then be required for the signatory to outline how they're going to address that and by when and, and who's going to be responsible. So there will be some feedback required from the signatory once they've received that corrective action for uh, report so that the monitoring of that can uh, and assistance can be provided to that program. Thanks, Tim. A, another question uh, for you regarding national federations. To what extent are international federations liable for being declared non-compliant on the basis of any failures by respective national federations in terms of complying with the code? Thanks, Ben. Well, there's a, a clear provision in the in the code under the international federal the responsibilities of international federations in that. IFs are responsible for ensuring that it's a condition of membership to the federal, to the International Federation that national federation policies, rules and programs are in compliance with the code. So therefore the responsibility is on the IF to ensure that their member federations are uh, doing the right thing and, and implementing the program accordingly. I know it's a, it's a big program for international federations to monitor but those where um, it's identified, then there will be a requirement obviously on the IF to assist the Federation in addressing that. And on the flip side, there's also obviously the National Federations and the National Anti-Doping Organisations are closely linked together. So through the IF and, and working with the NATO in collaboration, you hopefully address any, any shortfalls on those National Federations. <coughs> Thanks, Tim. Uh, time for a few more questions. The next one for Kevin. Uh, Kevin, can you can you clarify how long the review process will take once an anti-doping organisation has submitted their questionnaire? Thanks, Ben. Um, it largely depends on on what the questions that was asked earlier in terms of the priorities. Uh, set. If we receive 300 questionnaires all in one go, uh, we won't be able to commit to a, a set period of time. But it is our intention to review them as they are received and organise them uh, in a priority basis so that we, we can take the, the more higher priority questionnaires first and hopefully get back to signatories with their corrective actions if required as soon as possible. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, another question here for, for Fred. Uh, Fred, what's the long-term plan to ensure that every anti-doping organisation is audited over a period of time so that some organisations do not go unaudited or is it possible that some might indeed not face audits? 
I think we'll need to be realistic here and uh, uh, it is it is clear that we want to do a job that is as uh, comprehensive and as good as possible in terms of monitoring compliance of all signatories with the World Anti-Doping Code and this will be done as we have explained earlier in this presentation through a number of ways including uh, the review of the self-assessment questionnaire, uh, data we receive, intelligence we receive and in some cases is audits. Uh, of course, WADA does not have the resources, be they financial or human, to audit every anti-doping organization that is a signatory to the World Anti-Doping Code. We will need to prioritize. This will be done on a number of criteria that have been uh, set forth and explained earlier in uh, this presentation, and we will try to do a job that is as good as possible, uh, including by talking the audits as best as possible, but certainly we need to be very realistic and uh, we need to manage expectations in this particular matter. We will not be able to audit every single Ethiopian organization. Well, thank you very much, Fred. That does conclude our session today. Thank you all for sending in your questions. Hopefully we got through uh, quite a number for you, and if you do have any follow-up questions, of course, please contact the team here at Weather by email and we'll address those for you. Uh, thank you again to Tim, to Kevin and Emiliano and indeed to Fred uh, for today's session. Uh, just a reminder that we will have a recording of the webinar emailed out to you later today, so uh, there's a chance for you to listen back to it uh, later on. Uh, and just a couple more reminders, we will be communicating on the topic of compliance in the coming weeks and months. Uh, if you do have any other uh, questions, you can of course contact your regional office as well to, uh, who will address those for you. And as touched on earlier today, we do have the WADA Symposium coming up uh, later in March, from the 13th to the 15th of March in Lausanne, so we will have a booth on site uh, with a team there to answer your questions as well. So thank you again all for tuning in, and from us all in Montreal, a very good morning. <laughs>